Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I am staff writer Cody Goodwin alongside fellow staff writer Mike Rodak. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm sure Mike is as well because we have a lot to talk about. We've got a senior bowl that I was at earlier this week. Um, got to spend a few minutes with the new Alabama head football coach, Kalen DeBoer. Um, one of the assistants that he is bringing over, maybe potentially could be leaving. He's at least under consideration. That's offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, potentially joining the Seahawks. We'll touch on that. We'll also touch on baseball because had some news come out of the NCAA regarding, uh, Bo Hannon, um, and penalties and just some really hilarious language in the report that the NCAA released. We'll get to that near the end of the show, but Mike, I wanted to start today's show, um, with a look at the SCC men's basketball standings, because I think if you'd have told Nate Oates, Alabama's head basketball coach, that he would lose two top 20 picks to the NBA draft, but by February 1st, he would be 15 and six overall and seven and one on top of the SEC conference. Um, I don't know if he'd call you a liar, but I think he'd be very, very happy with however he got there, right? Yeah, you know, I think it's been a good month of January in general um, for Alabama basketball after what was, you know, not a great end of November and, and December, really. Um, so that, you know, certainly an improvement. Um, you know, I think to have lost, you know, what they lost from last year's team and then, um, you know, be in the position where they are, where, you know, they control their destiny, as we like to say in this business. You know, they they went out, then they're <laughs> SEC champions again. Um, you know, they're the number one seed in the um, SEC tournament. So, you know, that's that's where you want to be right now. With all that said, winning out is not <laughs> necessarily easy. Um, and, you know, I, Nate made the comment, Nate Oates, when, you know, they had beaten Vanderbilt, South Carolina, Mississippi State, Missouri to start their SEC schedule. When they were going to Tennessee. And I think he even mentioned their combined record of those teams that they had beaten going into that game. It was like three and 15 or something like that. Um, and he said, you know, we got to show we can beat a good team. And they went to Knoxville and they got crushed by Tennessee. Um, and, you know, since then, obviously the, the win against Auburn, I think is, is really their, um, their signature win right now, if you will, in terms of NCAA tournament seating and, and all of that. Um, otherwise, you know, again, Nate's very real, and I think he would be the one to tell you that the teams they beat in Vanderbilt's in last place in the SEC, Missouri's in second to last place, they're 0 and 8, Vandy's 0 and 7, Mississippi State's they beat on the road, they're 3 and 5, underperforming, LSU is 3 and 4, they're in 11th or 10th place in the SEC, and Georgia's very kind of middling, better than last year, but 4 and 4 in the SEC. So they still need to play Tennessee at home, they still need to play Auburn on the road. They have beaten South Carolina, which South Carolina is the biggest surprise of the SEC. They were picked, I'm pretty sure, picked to finish last in the SEC this year. They're currently six and two, second place in the SEC. They're kind of like A and M was last year. Um, but again, they have to play Tennessee at home. They have to go to Auburn. They have to go to Kentucky. They have to play Florida at home. Uh, they have to play Ole Miss on the road. Um, so. If they play Florida on the road as well. So there's still, I would say their second half of their SEC schedule is going to be a lot tougher than the first half is. And um, that's, it's good that they are where they are because you don't want to be in a bad spot going into the harder part of your schedule. Um, but there's still a lot to be determined. And I think, again, Nate would be the first one to tell you that they, I think he even said it after the Georgia game the other night, that they haven't really played a complete game in January, even though they were, seven to one in the sec um he really wants to see a more complete game and uh they're gonna need it you know i'd say starting with the auburn game next week yeah no i think that's that's totally fair analysis um they have won three in a row they have won nine of ten since losing three straight to purdue creighton and arizona um they just they they are finding different ways to win like more often than not they're outscoring teams which is just that's what they're going to do this year um you know, Nate seems to, you know, every time it seems like they break 100, Nate's like, well, the defense has to get better. Um, wrote about that earlier last week. Just, you know, hey, the hallmark. They don't have to be a great defense, but, like, they do need some defensive improvement, I think, if they're going to want to make a run in March because it just – teams that outscore other teams, they're fun to watch over the course of the regular season. They don't normally make deep runs in March. Um, what I think has impressed me the most over this run is that this they seem to have – 
the between the ears aspect to maybe make a run in March. And I think that was never more evident than on Wednesday when they beat Georgia, right? They rallied from down 17 2 they were, you know, what it was 41, 27 at half. And then they shoot 60% from the floor and storm back. I think they take the lead with five minutes left and they never let it go. Um, Final score, 85, 76. Uh, What maybe impressed you the most about that particular win? I think Grant Nelson doing what he did, making the two shots at the end, the two three-pointers after he was shooting, I think, 19% uh, on threes in SEC play, just could not hit one and hit two in pretty key moment where Georgia was still in position where they could win that game if they – um, you know, it was within, I think, three points, and, and Nelson kind of kept that that distance. So, um, I mean, he's been the biggest change, I would say, the biggest positive. Um, you know, if you're looking, like, if you're looking, is this team going to make a run in March? Like, they needed Grant Nelson to play better, and we've seen that. The end of the Auburn game, played tough, got the rebounds, did what he needed to do in that game. End of the Georgia game was doing that, too. And he's his role has changed. I think they've figured out that they can't quite play him in that Kevin Durant type. Here's your six eleven guy handling the ball and shooting threes all the time. Like that's what they thought they had in Grant Nelson. That's what he did at North Dakota State really well. It did not work the first two or three months of the season. I think we could all see that. And now they've made him more of the the five. Um, you know, with Nick Pringles, his situation, and with Muhammad Wagi being hurt again or banged up again. Um, they didn't really have a five, so they made Nelson that guy, and he's been more of a post player. He scored a lot in the post early in that Georgia game, and if you have to shoot a couple threes here and there, he can still make them. So that's that tweak, I think, has done really well for him, um, that tweak to the lineup. Now it also makes him a little bit smaller if they're starting Rylan Griffin at the four, as they have, and as we saw in the beginning of that Georgia game, you know, rebounding was a huge issue. So they're going to have to figure out, especially against teams with a, a good big man like how do they play? If well, We're going to see about Nick Pringle. I mean, as of right now, it seems on, he's still on the team on Friday morning, but like there's he's already been suspended twice this year. Like, who knows what's really going to happen down the road with him? Um, so, yeah, I mean, Nelson's the biggest change. You already had Mark Sears. Mark Sears has been playing out of his mind, plays tough, plays hard. As Nate says, doesn't, you know, he's going to keep them from losing a game. He's, he's not going to allow them to lose. Um, but they needed other guys to step up. I think Nelson's been the biggest one the last week. And uh, look, I mean, they can probably still get some more of Marin Estrada. I think that's that's been a little bit of a um, regression to some point from him. Um, but if he gets going and Nelson gets going and Sears gets going, then that's the team I think can really do some damage in March. Yeah, you know, kind of the, you know, to make another Warriors-ish reference, like when they go small, like that, that's not quite a death lineup, so to speak, but like that is, I think their best lineup. I think we learned that over the last few weeks that they're just, they're very efficient offensively. And when you get all those shooters, that's just, it, there's a lot of pressure on the opposing defense and they tend to, mm-hmm. they tend to more or less have their way when they've got the rock. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I think it's the lineup we're going to see a lot more going forward. Um, and I guess for, you know, a good thing is that they don't have to play at Purdue, um, you know, down the stretch here where, uh, you know, there's a Zach Eady to worry about down low. Maybe they will in the tournament, but for right now, they, I think they can get away with kind of the smaller lineup. Yeah, I think the other thing that has maybe stuck out about this run through the month of January that Alabama just got done with, um, sometimes in conference play, whether it's the SEC, the Big 12, the Big 10, um, Big 12 might be a little different just because they're just really, really good, but um, <clears throat> teams sometimes just take really silly losses. Um, and Alabama avoided that like they went to Tennessee and got their brakes beat off but other than that like they handled business right like they took care of Mississippi State they're gonna have to see them again they took care of Missouri South Carolina win looks better and better took care of Vanderbilt took care of Georgia took care of LSU um the schedule will obviously get tougher you know through this month of February but just you know you look at the SEC standings we hit on it earlier South Carolina six and two Auburn six and two Tennessee five and two Ole Miss five and three Kentucky five and three Florida five and three like they are a game clear of that mess and teams that normally win regular season conference championships we'll see how these guys do in a tournament I think they have the offense to catch fire and you know rattle off a few games especially back to backs like the SEC tournament's going to be but teams that win regular season conference championships they don't really lose silly games and they went through the month of January I think without really 
dropping a head scratcher. And that I think is going to serve them very, very big in the long run because you can kind of look across SEC is good, right? Um, but you know, a couple of games here and there, it's kind of like, you know, Tennessee lost a, a game. Maybe they shouldn't have Auburn, right. Went to Mississippi state and lost a game. Like there's just Florida beat Kentucky on the road and Florida looks like they're going to be a pretty tough team, but like, you know, like how often does Kentucky lose games on the road? Maybe more so in recent years than in previous years, you know, in the Calipari regime, but um, just, yeah, I don't know, like Alabama avoided the hiccup in mm -hmm. the month of January. And that I think is, is very, very impressive and, and could pay pretty big dividends here through the month of February, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, kind of the problem with the team two years ago is they beat the good teams. They beat Baylor that year. Um, who was a top five team. And, um, there's another one that I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but they lost to Georgia on the road. Georgia was terrible. And that was kind of the thing that Nate kept bringing up was like, can't just give away games like that. And to some extent they did it last year. I mean, Oklahoma was a good team, but they went to Oklahoma and just, you know, got completely throttled. Um, there was a few games. It's just like, you know, what are you guys doing? Um, and that's what it looked like for 30 minutes of the game Wednesday night. Um, but again, to their credit, they, they kind of pulled it together late. And I think at this point too, it would probably be a disappointment if they weren't the top four seed double by in the tournament. Cause that would mean losing at least two games. Cause they're already a game up on South Carolina and Auburn right now. You know, we'll have to see what happens with Auburn next week, but they have the tiebreaker over both of those schools. So you're losing at least two games to drop down to five, probably three or four games, you know, over the final 10. So that would be a pretty big disappointment if for some reason Alabama's playing on Thursday in Nashville. I think right now this is a team that fairly solidly is looking like a, um, you know, a double buy team. Yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see. They get Mississippi State on Saturday at home, already beat them in Starkville. Um, this I kind of similar to how I viewed the LSU game last week. This is one of those games where it's, you got a visiting team that's coming in. You're better than them. Go take care of business. Like just get the win, get the eight and one and keep the train moving. That's, I, that's how I'm viewing this game. I don't know if you have anything specific that you'll be keeping an eye on. <clears throat> yeah. It's just, I don't know what's wrong with Mississippi state this year. Um, you know, they've lost some close games. They just lost to Ole Miss, you know, pretty close in the road. I was crazy environment. Great arena, by the way. Um, Oxford, you know, the pavilion they have there is is kind of the the model for what Alabama wants to build in Tuscaloosa. Whenever that happens, we'll see. Um, you know, Mississippi State's lost to South Carolina close. They lost to Kentucky, not really close. They lost to Alabama fairly close, Florida fairly close. So they've lost to some good teams. Um, but people still thought this was a top 25 Mississippi State team coming into the year. You know, they dealt with Tolu Smith being injured the first couple months. They're still dangerous, and I think that's something that Nate's going to stress today when we talk to him. Um, but, yeah, it's a game that I think absolutely, given Alabama's home record, which I think now is 50-5 and five over the past three-plus seasons, um, you got to just continue that and keep winning here. If you can do the hard stuff well, don't screw up the easy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Not that Saturday's going to be an easy game, but it's a game Alabama should take advantage of the senior bowl was this week is this week there's a week of practice the game is actually on saturday down in mobile i was down there for a couple days to watch practice to talk to some folks alabama has three representatives um chris braswell justin aboigby and will reichard um, went down and talked to all of them on wednesday and thursday um also got to talk to some washington players um to kind of get a feel for kaylin DeBoer, ryan grubb their coaching style we got to talk to michael Penix jr for a bit he was one of the more popular guys down there all the quarterbacks were um also got to talk to carter bradley who's uh, starting quarterback south alabama for the last two years got to talk to him about uh, kane womack incoming defensive coordinator for alabama um also got to watch some practice i don't know about you mike i love watching practice um I'm not a scout or anything, but like, I just enjoy watching how the players kind of go through things, how they go through drills, what's their effort look like, you know, what, what kind of techniques are they working on? Um, I, I, so I enjoyed that aspect of the senior bowl week festivities. Um, also got to enjoy talking to them and just, you know, about what feedback they're hearing from scouts. Um, you know, none of them, them revealed what NFL teams they've actually heard from over the course of the week, but obviously all the franchises were well represented bunch of different scouts bunch of different draft junkies and gurus were there you know who's who's improving their stock who's maybe disappointed over the course of the week what's the game going to look like how many reps are these guys going to get um first time down there in mobile for me um i enjoyed it 
it was um, it kind of cleared out after practice on Thursday. Um, you know, I don't know that very many people are going to stick around for the game. Um, I'm going to watch it from home on Saturday. Um, but I, yeah, there was I, a lot of little things to pick from. I don't know that there was anything too huge newsworthy. It was interesting, though, to talk to a boy, B, Braswell and Reichert about, um, you know, Nick Saban briefly. Right. Just where were they when he when his retirement announcement came out? What did they think? Um, Chris Braswell was kind of funny. He's like, I thought it was an Internet meme. Like, I didn't think it was true. And then he called a couple people and. Um, you know, I guess a Boygby thought the same thing and somebody actually FaceTimed a Boygby into the locker room. So he like got to see all the stunned faces, you know, shortly after they had their team meeting on January 10th. Um, you know, and then I, I thought it was kind of cool. Um, you know, maybe this is just me being a nerd, but you know, Hey, like what's, what are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from Nick Saban, you know, getting the chance to play for him. Not every player gets that. Like, you know, he preaches a lot of hard work, discipline, you know, he made a living off of his process. And so it was just kind of fun to like, hear some of their stories about, you know, playing for Saban. What was it like hearing the news? Um, what are you going to remember most that type of thing? Um, you know, so those guys were all really good about, you know, sharing some of that stuff with us. Yeah. It's been, uh, it's been 10 years now since I've been to the senior bowl. It used that was the old, um, lad people stadium so you actually got to go to the newer one um was it hancock whitney i believe in south alabama <clears throat> so i've not been i've not been since that new one has opened um and i would assume it's a bigger event than it used to be <clears throat> it's kind of grown over the years because it was kind of the event that people would go to but it was still kind of um let's say secret but it was very kind of not mainstream 20 years ago let's say and then it's really picked up um you know as draft nicks and kind of the draft twitter and draft world around the nfl has picked up as well so i'm sure there's a lot of media there um yeah, there will be at the combine too and at the combine you get the same questions which teams have you talked to um you know <laughs> it, a lot of these guys don't even i don't say they don't know but it's like you have these whirlwind interviews in mobile and then the combine is even fat it's like speed dating um, these interviews, 10 minutes or whatever, you have a formal, informal, and then you have all these facility visits that, you know, the top 30 where players go to the NFL facilities, you have the campus visits where the coaches come there, you have the pro day. Uh, to me, those questions are ne never made sense because every team is going to talk to pretty much everybody at one of those places or multiple. So trying to read into, you know, a guy saying in Mobile, oh, I talked to the Chiefs and I talked to the Bucks and trying to like piece together what that means. Like it's it's always kind of silly. Uh, but I agree. Practice can be um, informative. Um, I think, like you said, most NFL media types are out by the end of the week. And a lot of scouts are, too. I think that scouts really want to see the practices up close. They want to see the one on one reps in particular with some of the linemen you know, wide receivers and DBs, they want to just see it. But the game itself, you might certainly watch the film and see how guys played. But um, a lot of the scouting happens during the week for the Senior Bowl. And I'm surprised there's only three guys there from Alabama, given there's 12 guys in the draft and given that the, um, you know, it's opened up to underclassmen this year. So I think maybe some guys just kind of view it as they don't really need it. Um, I don't you know, know for certain whether some of those players were invited. I would assume like a JC Latham was, I'd assume Terry on Kool-Aid were, I would assume Dallas Turner was. Um, but if you're already a first round pick, sometimes there can be a little bit of, uh, there's more downside to it than, than upside. And, you know, I think some players are skipping out in the senior bowl because of that, which is what it is. Like guys make their own decisions. So um, still, you know, some good players there and, Obviously, I think it it probably helps Braswell and Boyd B to get in front of some people, and you know, probably both day two picks. Maybe Braswell's a, a first round pick if he, you know, really shows something the next couple months. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe I got from <clears throat> you know talking to these guys. Like, what do you want to prove to them? What do you want to you know? What do you want to learn about yourself, or what do you want to show scouts, franchises? over the course of the week and you know it seems like these all-star games right like because the east west shrine bowl was last night too and tresman marshall and jalen key played in that game um so then you got three more guys playing in the senior bowl um it seems like it, they're kind of tailor-made for guys who maybe need another opportunity to improve their stock a little bit right like i think braswell mostly projected as a day two guy but you know depending on how the first round falls he could be kind of you know a fringe first round guy right he could be you know somewhere in that 27 to 32 range um a boy b seems 
late day two, early day three, you know, if he, with a good showing this week, maybe he jumps firmly into that, you know, day two, um, spot, right. Round two, round three, potential draft pick. Will Reichard, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know yeah. that kickers get drafted all that often, but like, hey, you know what? He looked really good this week, right? Like he, I know he wanted to work on his uh, kickoffs this past season, but you know, his, his kickoffs look good. They each kickoff that I saw at least on between Wednesday and Thursday, six or seven yards deep in the end zone. He, I think it was on Tuesday. There was a video circulating that he nailed a 60 yard field goal. It was against air. It wasn't like it was again. It wasn't like there was the snap in, um, you know, defense, but um, strong leg. Um, when he was operating with the snap in the defense, um, he hit, uh, I think it was three from 50 plus on Thursday. Um, so he looked good there. It was really fun to watch the one-on-ones. Like I, there was a lot of people that were, you know, cause there's a lot of quarterbacks there, right? Michael Penix, mm-hmm. Jr., Bo Nick, Spencer Rattler, uh, Joe Milton, Sam Hartman. I'm forgetting Carter Bradley. I'm probably forgetting one or two. Um, so people loved watching those guys. They loved watching the, the receiver corner one-on-one. Um, obviously with Braswell and a Boygby, I was watching the offensive line, defensive line. Um, this was on Wednesday or no Thursday, excuse me. A Boygby looked like he won all of his one-on-ones. Um, Braswell was a little bit more hit and miss, um, you know, cause they kind of do that drill where, you know, they have the five linemen lined up, they have three defensive linemen lined up and then they send one of them and they have to like get around and win and get to the coach and, um, that was just kind of fun to like watch, um, you know, cause like not only do you get to watch the guys that were there to cover, but like you get to see Tavondre sweat and you get to see, um, you know, some other defensive linemen and other offensive linemen like Javon Foster from Mizzou. He I looked like he was having a really good week. Um, so just like a lot of like little stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it seems like the, these, you know, if you're, if you're a Dallas Turner, like you, you're more or less a lock to be a first round pick, like right. you don't necessarily have to go to this, right? Like you can go to the combine, you could go to a pro day, your agents probably working all the phones for you while you're working out somewhere in Florida, probably. Um, we'll see if those guys even run all the combine stuff. Sometimes they'll just run a 40 or they'll do a 40 at their pro day, not the combine or their combine and not the pro day. Like if you're that high in a draft, you're trying to minimize your exposure. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, or just do the workouts that you know, you're going to kill it in. Right. right. You know, so like if you're Terry on or Kool-Aid, you probably run the 40 and that's, you know, 40 in the broad jump. Maybe mm-hmm. if you're Dallas and JC Latham, like, you know, probably just do bench press. Um, I guess if you're Dallas, like maybe do the shuttle drill just to kind of show how your feet are. Like maybe that could help Latham too. I don't know. I'm a proponent of do everything, but the NFL draft process is so bizarre and weird. And, you know, they were revealing hand measurements for the kickers this week at the senior bowl. And it's like, (laughs) why? Like they don't, that doesn't matter. It's really funny how like scientific, the NFL draft process has become. And then the Browns are just like, you know what? Joe Flacco's over there on the couch. Let's just sign him. And then they make the playoffs. Like it's, you know, like how important is all these details anyway? They're not. And just a lot of (laughs) players will just say like, turn on the film, watch the film. And and a lot of scouts operate that way too. Like they don't care about the combine measurables. They just care about what they see on film. Yeah. That's uh, that's, I don't know. Those are some of my favorite GMs because they don't worry about, you know, hand size and weight and how many i think there's some value in some of the workouts that they do but like i don't know like i'm there's a big not, I'm a, film yeah, guy. a lot of them don't <laughs> i think it it needs some redesigning but it's one of those things where it's they've done it for so long and it provides it's a consistency so it provides something they can compare to past players and so nobody really wants to change it because then you're kind of changing the um the standard if you will yeah so that's the problem I will say the the final funny note on the senior bowl. It's been interesting to see how like the NFL draft, like complex, like media complex specifically has grown in the same way that like, you know, two, four, sevens, like recruiting complex. Like it's just like its its own entity. I mean, there's people who solely cover and think about the draft um, as opposed to people who cover teams. So that, and it wasn't even that way to a large degree when I covered the NFL early on, I mean, probably towards the end for me, that really started to grow. And I think it's taken off even more. Um, there's just some people that are just wired that way. Like there's, I mean, they're not professionals, they're not scouts, but they just have this desire to like find the next guy, um, and dig into all that stuff. And in some cases, those guys become scouts, they become professionals, but some people just do it for fun. Um, grind the tape for fun. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you don't have kids, like 
you don't have a life, you know, like if you want to do that, you can, but um, I don't know if I'd be watching film of like middle Tennessee players, you know, in the middle of January, trying to find the next one. If I'm not even working for a team that needs the player. <laughs> Uh, while we were at the senior bowl though, um, Kalen DeVore made an appearance. He was, he was there on Wednesday. So we got to chat with him for a little bit. There was a lot of questions about Michael Penix jr. Right. And a lot of the Washington players that were there because obviously that was his old job. So there was a fun video of him and Michael Penix talking before one of the practices, or maybe it was after one of the practices on Wednesday. Um, but we got to talk to him a little bit. He talked, uh, you know, a little bit about, um, you know, kind of meshed his two worlds together. Right. Talked a lot about Washington, but also, you know, talked about, some of the things he's got going on in Alabama, why some of the Washington guys followed him there, right? Jeremy Bernard, Parker Brailsford, and Austin Mack, um, you know, talked about the some of the staff hires. He did make mention that they're they're not 100% done yet, and there's another part of that that we'll get to here in a minute. But, um, you know, kind of in going back and watching the video or just kind of, you know, reading some of the stuff that was written, Mike, was there anything outstanding that jumped out to you about what we talked to Kalen DeBoer about on Wednesday? be honest no i i listened to the video i wasn't there you know you guys were down there but i got like five or six minutes through i'm like man <laughs> this is not nick saban like no uh because sometimes you're hanging on every word that saban says and saban you know sometimes it can get a little bit boring a little bit repetitive but he's nick saban so like everything he says you're always listening um you know i think kalen Bohr's already kind of gotten into like his talking points as far as you know, he's I'm sure he's getting a lot of the same questions when he does these things in terms of replacing Nick Saban and going to Alabama and being in the South. And um, he sort of has stuck to the script um, and not incredibly revealing to this point. So um, to be honest, no, I, I listened back and I was like, yeah, uh, even, you know, some of the stuff about, I guess, Austin Mack and some of the new players, but wasn't a ton that he uh he really mentioned about those guys i do wonder like inside baseball wise like you know we would we would share everything that nick saban would say in a given press conference mm -hmm. um i wonder if alabama fans want the same thing from kaylin DeBoer. like is it just because he's in the position he's in is it you know is it going to take him winning a national title first before everybody just kind of leans in whenever he says something like i don't know like that's that was that was one of the random thoughts like not part of his press conference but that was something that maybe came to mind a little bit i've it's thought about it too no because it's honestly i think to some degree and this depends on how much saban will be on tv next year it's like we're gonna be covering two coaches because everything that nick saban says about alabama we're going to be writing about because people are going to want to read it and listen to it and know what saban's saying about alabama but then we're also covering the actual coach of alabama so um i don't know i i think there's probably still more value like let's say Saban's on game day next year and he gives a 30 second spiel on what he's seeing from Alabama people are probably going to listen to that more than they will Kalen DeBoer on a Wednesday night or whenever DeBoer goes maybe he won't be a Wednesday night guy anymore um so I don't know like I, I don't know how effusive of a talker he was in Washington it doesn't seem like he really was um I don't think he's Nate Oates where you know Nate's going to speak his mind and you're pretty blunt about his team a lot of times. Like I don't get that sense from DeBoer. So I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it's it's kind of uncharted territory for us. But at the end of the day, it's still Alabama football. It's still the head coach of Alabama football. So, um, you know, maybe from that standpoint, everything he says is notable. Yeah, 100%. Uh, a couple of the things that I maybe found a little interesting <clears throat> from listening to DeBoer. Um, you know, somebody asked him about his Washington receivers, right? They had three very, very good receivers last year. Two of them projected to be pretty solid first round NFL draft picks in April. Um, sounds like DeBoer is using that as a pitch, right? To the current Alabama receivers. Sounds like that's what he used heavily in the recruitment of Ryan Williams, five-star receiver. Um, you know, he said this specifically, you know, when you put it that way with two potential first round draft picks, I think it sells itself, but then you dive into how we got to that point scheme and all that. Yeah. But it's a lot of development and that's going to happen, not just at the receiver position, but across the entire football team. Um, thought that was a nice little line. He also talked about, um, retaining Freddie Roach and Robert Gillespie, the two holdovers from Saban's 2023 class. Um, he was his, um, he actually, he gave them a lot of credit, like similar to Saban, like when things go well, he defers. Um, you know, first of all, you listen to what people around the program have to say in regards to their relationships with the players, how strong their position groups are, 
why they are, um, who they are as people, as well as what their impact has been in recruiting. These guys, Roach and Gillespie, are amazing. They've helped us keep the team together through some tough times, even before I was hired. I think they had a huge impact on that. Once I got here, just locking arms with them and trusting them, just like I asked the guys to be all in with me, I was all in with them. They've allowed us to hit the ground running these last two weeks on the recruiting trail. I can see very clearly that we made some good decisions by keeping them here. Um, Roach coaches the defensive line. Gillespie coaches the running back room. Um, I know Alabama's had 27 total defections, departures uh, through the transfer portal since it opened in uh, early December, 10 since Nick Saban retired. Hardly any of them have been from the running back room or the defensive line room. Um, and I think a lot of credit goes to Roach and Gillespie for that. Um, and I think that's really, I, you know, kind of a sneaky underrated thing when you look at the makeup of Alabama's roster. I know they've got some holes and stuff that they need to plug probably after the spring practices. Um, so, you know, the April portal window we'll be paying close attention to, but um, running backs and defensive line, like more or less held together a hundred percent. I think that's a pretty big thumbs up. Yeah. I think the retention of justice Haynes in particular, more than any other player in the roster is probably their biggest win right now. Um you know, and again, there's still the April period. There's still a whole spring practice for guys to kind of feel things out. Like we can't close the book on any of this yet. Um, but if they're able to keep Justice Haynes for this season, I think that's that's a huge win. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that and to be honest, that you talk about things that I noticed about DeBoer. That's the second time now that he's he's really been um, he's been specific in mentioning that a lot of the transfer portal guys were gone before he was here. Cause he also did it on the McAfee show a couple weeks ago. And I noticed he did it again in mobile. Like that's kind of been one of his, his talking points and rightfully so like he's not taking ownership and everybody's going to look at it. Well, you know, there's 28 guys in the portal or whatever for Alabama. Like he's not taking ownership of that um, in a good way. Like I'm saying, he's not, he's not trying to pin that on himself as, as other people might be in, I feel like we haven't, like, I think we've been clear, like a lot of these guys were gone in December and then there's a lot of them were DBs. Like that was, right. you know, that was Saban's thing. Yeah. I mean, guys were gone after the Rose bowl. We spent an entire week. It seemed like nonstop with guys leaving. Um, <clears throat> now from a volume standpoint, it slowed down actually after DeBoer, it was only 10 guys compared to 18 before that. Um, but it was also, a higher quality of player. And I think that's, that's something that shouldn't get lost either is that, you know, to lose Caleb Downs, Caden Proctor, Julian saying um, to some extent, like a Trey Amos and Amari Nyblack are probably big contributors. Yeah. That hurt a little bit more than losing Anquin Barnes or Monkel Goodwine or guys like that. Um, so that can't be discounted either. But I, I did notice that DeBoer certainly is, is making that point. And, and being sure to make that point publicly that um, a lot of these players were, were out the door before he was in the door. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good observation. Um, wanted to get, got two more topics on the rundown that I had for today's show. One of them involves uh, DeBoer staff, um, or at least, you know, the staff as we know it so far, haven't made a full announcement yet of the full staff, um, but his presumed offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, who has been with DeBoer at Sioux Falls, he was with him at Washington. Um, he might've been with him at Fresno. I don't believe he was, but I know he for sure was there the last couple years at Washington. Um, Ryan Grubb being considered for an NFL gig, um, Seattle Seahawks specifically. So Mike McDonald, who was the Ravens defensive coordinator, was hired to take over Seattle after Pete Carroll retired. Um, or I, was did he retire or did they give him the boot? Uh, I think firing is probably the right. I think they made him like a senior advisor, but okay. I'm sure Pete Carroll wanted to continue coaching. So okay, it was a graceful exit, shall we say, but I don't think it was his own choice. Um, in any case, Mike McDonald, uh, orchestrator of the phenomenal Baltimore Ravens defense this past NFL season, for those of you who watch Pro Bowl, um, now the head coach in Seattle, and it sounds like Ryan Grubb is under consideration. Um, first reported by Mike Florio, our own John Talty confirmed it, folks up in Seattle confirmed it. It sounds like there are still interviews and rounds being made, so it's, he's not the only name up for consideration for the Seahawks offensive coordinator job. Um but kind of like a mini bomb, so to speak. Like, I think they're, you know, judged on our board's reaction. And I think, you know, we were all kind of talking about it in our own little group chat. Um, this would be a, not like a seismic loss, um, 
But I think it would have a little bit of an impact, right, on what Alabama's 2024 prospects would be if, you know, the offensive coordinator of, you know, a lot of DeBoer's best teams decides to not be there anymore. Like this, this could potentially be a pretty sneaky big loss if he doesn't end up in Tuscaloosa. Right. I mean, it's <clears throat> DeBoer's a really good coach. I don't think there's a ton of um, doubt or debate about that, but Grubb has been with him a lot a lot of the way here. I mean, like you said, the two years in Washington, he was the offensive coordinator for the two years in Fresno. Um, and he was his offensive coordinator at Sioux Falls for I think his last three years. Um, he was also the offensive line coach with DeBoer at Eastern Michigan when DeBoer was the, um, the OC there. So they've spent much of their career together. There was a little bit where I think DeBoer went, when DeBoer was at Indiana, Grubb was still at Fresno and DeBoer was at, Southern Illinois uh, grub wasn't with them. But other than that, I mean, they've been together. So you're kind of, if this happens and we'll get to that in a second, but if it happens, then you're separating two guys who have been joined for a while and not, it's not the same as like a Belichick Brady, but sometimes you find out like which one was driving the train or were they both really good coaches? Uh, what does DeBoer look like without grub? What does grub look like without DeBoer? So that's something we'll have to see. Um, if it does happen and yeah, so I think it's maybe not like a huge loss, but it's like, it opens a lot of questions of, again, what does it mean this season when you're already kind of late in the game? Um, and I don't think you're talking about hiring another offensive coordinator in February. I mean, heck Alabama did it last year with, um, Tommy Reese, but that was to to have like a whole new system from a guy who's run the same system with the same coach for a while is I think a really tough thing to pull off. <clears throat> and DeBoer even said, you know, they're starting offensive install next week. So you can't just bring in a whole new offensive coordinator, new system and try to have your coaches learn it, but then also have the players learn. I think that's really tough. So I think the more likely scenario is that DeBoer calls plays if Grubb leaves and maybe you have like a Jamarcus Shepard who's been around for a little while and I forget if he was – he might have had a co-OC title, a passing game coordinator title in Washington, but maybe you could give him that title. Or, you know, you have Nick Sheridan, who's been an offensive coordinator before, who's a tight ends coach, or Scott Huff, the offensive line coach, give them, like, the run game coordinator title. And then maybe you hire, like, a quarterback's coach just to work directly with those guys. So that would be my guess on how it would go down. Um, you know, it's not a done deal. Nobody said it's a done deal but it's very real that he's being considered um, as you know, it was also mentioned or reported last night that Tanner Engstrad, the, um, you know, the lions passing game coordinator was um, also on the radar of the Seahawks. And, you know, they're requesting permission to talk to him. So, you know, as any other job search will go, there's multiple candidates, but it does seem like, you know, once a name comes out like this, sometimes it's the name that they want. It's the name that, say the deal's imminent or close, but like sometimes it doesn't take very long for this to turn into something more official. So um, we'll see where it goes, you know, the next couple of days, but I would imagine that Ryan Grubb and Kalen Boer have been talking about this for at least a few days, if not longer. Like I think it's probably been under radar more than just the last day. Yeah. I imagine there's some sort of contingency plan in place and we'll obviously talk a lot more about, you know, some of these other branches that come from a move like this. I mean, you mentioned just what does this mean for Alabama specifically? I think it makes sense for Kalen DeBoer to call the plays. I think it makes a lot of sense for a guy like Jamarcus Shepard to, you know, maybe be the offensive coordinator, um, you know, offensive coordinator, pass game coordinator, something like that. So then maybe you bring in a, another receivers coach or, you know, I, the other interesting thing to me is that they, they haven't, you know, we, as of right now, assuming Grubb stays nine man staff. So there's still one more spot available. Um, you know, it's, Maybe they bring another guy in from Washington, you know, that defensive coordinator or not defensive coordinator, but a defensive assistant and special teams coordinator. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if Grubb leaves, there's two open spots now. Um, So how do they go about filling that? You got to think one offense, one defense. But what does that look like? Um, You know, and I think the other interesting thing, too, is that a lot more we saw it this week with Boston College, um, their head coach headed to Green Bay to be the defensive coordinator. A lot of guys jumping from the college game to the pro game. and that I think would be a very interesting conversation to have should Grubb also make that jump. Cause there's, um, you know, 
a lot of if you if you talk to a lot of the college football diehards like not you know the casuals the diehards there's there's a lot in this sport that need to be fixed and there's a lot of coaches that more or less kind of looking for a way out and so you know not that grub doesn't like recruiting he's obviously been out there recruiting and um you know helping alabama since DeBoer was was hired right like there's something was signed for him to be able to go do that um you know but you know if you can get to the pro game right like that's you know one you get to leave all this nil stuff and recruiting and transfer portal nonsense behind but two like that's the professional game. Like that is the top of the sport. That's where a lot of coaches ultimately want to get to. And if this is his window and he gets the offer, I would be surprised if he didn't take it. Right. right. So it's, you know, a lot more that we can expand on that, but that's more or less the short version of that thought. Right. I know sometimes there's college football fans, not just in Alabama, but in a lot of places that's like, you know, why would you turn down a college job for an NFL? Why would you turn down an NFL job for a college job or no? I'm sorry. I'm still waking up today. Why would you turn down a, college job staying at a college to go to the nfl right is what i'm trying to say and i, I think a lot of guys it's a no-brainer um i mean the salary is typically similar you know low seven figures to be a coordinator in the nfl versus a high level college program and as you mentioned the lifestyle is a lot better you're not recruiting you're not worrying about all the stuff that coaches have to worry about and you're dealing with the best players in the world so it's just the, it's the pinnacle of, of the level of it's the pinnacle of the sport, you know, the level of competition. So um, I think for a lot of guys, it makes sense. And like, I, again, I would be surprised myself if Ryan Grubb turned down a Seahawks offer to stay at Alabama. Yeah, that's uh, that's something we'll be keeping tabs on. Just kind of see what it means, obviously, for Alabama. You know, interesting conversation, I think, to be had there about college coaches jumping to the pro game at least a little bit more frequently in you know maybe recent years and especially recent months um so we'll keep tabs on that last thing i wanted to get to on today's show mike was ncaa released a report um revealing the punishment for a former alabama baseball coach brad bohannon who was fired um last season not even a full year ago for um illegally i mean he didn't make bets on games but like he just he kind of informed guys to illegally bet on games and so the punishment came down 15 year show cause um alabama baseball program on probation I believe there's also a fine um and i like the reason i wanted to bring this up is because the report was kind of funny um right. like really really funny it's like um, dumb criminals not that they're criminals well burton f has been he's pleaded guilty to federal charges you know bohannon has been charged but it's just like dumb criminal activity where the things that they said were stupid. Like really dumb. Like no really, sense. really dumb. Um, right. Here's here's one of my favorite passages. Um, on April 28th, 2013, prior to Alabama baseball game against LSU, Bohannon sent several electronic messages via the Signal encrypted messaging app to a better that Bohannon knew was involved in sports wagering activities. The electronic messages indicated that an Alabama baseball player, the scheduled starting pitcher for that evening's game against LSU, would not start the game due to an injury. Bohannon provided this information to the better before reporting the starting lineup um, to the LSU coaching staff. Specifically, Bohannon texted the better, all caps, HAMMER. The player is out for sure. Let me know when I can tell LSU, hurry. Like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> right. And the funny thing is, it's encrypted, but these people should know better than going to a casino. Uh, or a sports book, which is what this was. And if you, some of the reporting when this first happened, you know, last summer was it was the camera in the sports book that was able to zoom in on this guy's phone because he was showing it to the sports book employees. And so the camera zoomed in, you could see Brad Bohannon's text, even though the, you know, it's encrypted and they probably didn't get the phones from either of these guys. And you know, Bohannon didn't give his phone to the NCAA. But they could see it on the camera because you're in a casino. Like casinos have that level of technology. Like, don't be stupid. All um, caps. Hammer. Right. And <laughs> and look, the one thing that's still and there's been some it, this case is so clear cut. Like the unsub blaze report. Oh yeah, like eight pages long. I mean, some of these things would be like thirty pages long. It's because the details of the case are so like obvious and direct, and it only needed a couple paragraphs to say what happened. Um, but I what I still want to know is how much Brad Bohannon was getting. Mm. How much of a cut 
like Brad Bohan is not just doing this out of the kindness of his heart to this guy from Indiana that he knows, like clearly he had to be getting something back in return, um, a cut of this money. And was Bohannon funding him? Like this guy was trying to put down a hundred G's on this game, which wasn't even allowed by the sports book. And Bohannon has a salary or had the salary to do that. I don't know if a youth baseball coach in Indiana had the salary to do that. So is Bohannon fronting him this money saying, spend it on this game that I'm coaching in and bet on the other team to win. And then I'll get a cut of that money. Because if that was the case, like, I mean, that, I think from a federal charge standpoint, Bohannon would be in jeopardy if he was like fixing the game somehow, if his managerial decisions were based on a gambling um, decision. So, you know, he hasn't been charged yet, but I would still wonder like what more details are to come out because that's like the key detail that's still missing to me is what was Bohannon's cut from this. Um, But, you know, he was stupid in what he was texting this guy and the guy was stupid in that he goes to this sports book and says, I have inside information on this. Like, look at, look at my text from the head coach of this team. Like, that was that was the the very next paragraph in the report. He I mean, tries to bet a hundred grand, like you said. The staff at <laughs> what Bet MGM Sportsbook at the Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati they limited him to a fifteen thousand dollar wager. The better than attempted to place additional wagers involving the Alabama LSU game. Um, Sportsbook said no due to suspicious activity. Duh. Um, the better's insistent demeanor to get the bet place and statements to the sportsbook staff that the bet was, quote, for sure going to win, end quote, and, quote, if only you guys knew what I knew, end quote. This is where it gets really dumb, <laughs> like you were alluding to. The suspicious activity also included the better showing sportsbook staff messages from Bohannon and explaining that the messages were Bohannon informing the better that Alabama was scratching its starting pitcher before the game against LSU. Like... <laughs> Guys, like if you're if you're going to do this, be smart, you know, like, I mean, first off, don't do it. But like, if you're right. going to do it, like, don't do that. That's why criminals are criminals, because they're dumb sometimes. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> so Bohannon gets a 15 year show cause, which, you know, people not that I've covered college sports for a very long time, but people who have are like, man, we've never seen that before. Um, and that's to be expected, like any sports league college you know ncaa included is always going to come down hard on gambling because it always they're scared about integrity the public trust yeah so you know 15 year show cost he'll be 62 63 years old when that ends Woo. Uh, if he's hired at any point during that time he has to serve a five-year suspension so no school is going to hire him and let him sit around for five years before they can actually coach so i mean as far as college sports goes he's done um you know, maybe I think if he wants to stay in baseball, maybe there's a minor league team somewhere that will hire him, be a hitting coach. Like, you know, nobody's really covering some of those teams. Like, I don't know if he'll really get a lot of press. Like, that would be the most likely possibility to me, or he just does something else with his life. But um, certainly a pretty good way to screw it up. Um, and, you know, beyond that, too, is the Alabama baseball program getting – three years of probation, which I think some people are a little bit upset about. Um, I think for any NCAA case like this, especially when there's egregious activity, there's going to be some element of institutional um, responsibility and not preventing it, not overseeing it. I think the NCAA is still being very lenient on Alabama and they kind of writ, they writ, they wrote in their um, report that, you know, Alabama had very little institutional culpability is what they said. And even though there was a previous uh, probation, you know, the basketball program is under probation for three years. It just ended in November based on what happened in 2017 with um, Kobe Baker. Um, they really didn't apply the repeat offender standard to the punishment uh, because they didn't think it really applied in this case. And Alabama was very cooperative. So, you know, it's one of those things where I think it would have been very hard for Alabama to pick up on this or to know that he was doing this. I think the NCAA's point is probably like maybe there should have been better education. And that's kind of what their corrective actions have included is a lot of gambling education. Um, Yeah. Again, it just goes back to the fact that if something happens under your watch, 
in some cases you you own that to some degree and i think the NCAA is saying you own that this much Alabama and we're going to give you three years of probation. <laughs> so it's just, it's yeah. a slap under rest and rightfully so. Yeah. That, uh, that all makes sense. I just, you know, sometimes when you get those reports, some details come out and it's just like, man, that is hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, and not in the best way either, but you know, that came out and obviously that was a big story with, uh, you know, Bohannon getting fired, the baseball team obviously get into a super and then, um, you know, now hiring a brand new head coach, uh, Rob Vaughn. And they uh, they recently just had their uh, opening press conference. They're going to start their preseason stuff if they haven't already. And um, it'll be baseball and softball season here before we know it, because the sports calendar, especially in college sports, does not sleep. So that was really, Mike, all the things I wanted to get through today. You got any other final thoughts before we sign off here for the weekend? No, that's it. Baseball's first game is uh, two weeks from today against Manhattan. Uh, in Tuscaloosa, and I believe softball starts earlier. I believe softball starts next week. Um, yeah, they have uh, their first game is next Thursday against Villanova as part of the Buzz Classic in Atlanta, and their first home game will be um, also next or two weeks from today against St. Thomas in Tuscaloosa. So, yeah, spring sports starting next week um, in terms of softball at least. Yeah. It'll be uh, baseball. Baseball is just going to have some intrigue with a new coach. Um, softball always has intrigue because that's a team that's routinely program. battling for spots in the College World Series every year. So yeah. we'll have to tap into a little bit of that when we're not covering uh, men's basketball. And then obviously spring ball is going to be here before we know it. But that's all we've got today, guys. We appreciate you tuning in. Only one show this week because we were all a little bit busy, mostly me being in Mobile. We'll circle back next week. Um, next week, we've got the late signing day, the normal signing day. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to call it, but we'll uh, we'll get Brett on the horn and talk some final recruiting stuff and also just kind of get a little bit of more intel on what the new coaching staff is doing on the recruiting trail. He's done a really good job tracking that every single day, just where the coaches are at. Um, we're approaching, I believe, a non-contact period, too. So, um, you know, we'll kind of set the stage for what uh, their plans are for the 2025 class. But first, we'll obviously put a bow on the 2024 class next week. Um, in the meantime, though, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. Believe we're still running a special. I think we're always running a special for our VIP membership. Put a link to that in the show notes. So go take advantage of that. As always, we appreciate you guys for listening. Thank you again, Mike, for joining me. We will talk to you all again soon.